do have a question from Gael. Uh, so, you know, really the, 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 the question is what makes an ETF, you know, growing and becoming a good long-term investment? Um, the companies in the ETF are economically growing and making more benefits in the real economy, or the fact that people, investors, are buying this specific ETF and making the shares more expensive. So she wants me to look the, at the example of T-Blue, which is a water ETF, or SDG, which is the Global Impact ETF. Why don't I use SDG, just because I uh, brought it up before, the iShares Global Impact ETF, just to help you understand what impacts the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the share price of an ETF. So what we want to do is first, let's look up SDG. Um, oh, sorry, that's SDGA. I want to be very clear. It's not SDGA. It's SDG, which is the iShares MSCI Global Impact ETF. Please don't make that mistake. So, you know, really what she's saying is that this is an ETF that's going to go up and down and up and down. You can see the crash and then, you know, it's come back up. This one has done sort of remarkably well during the crash. And that when we look at all the different companies inside of it, you know, really the question is, is it the companies and the earnings and the profitability of the companies? Or is it investors in this ETF that are gonna push the prices up or down? So this is a, an absolutely great question. And really what it comes down to is with ETFs, um, it's gonna depend on the assets under management, how big the ETF is. Now this ETF has about $110 million, which seems pretty big, but in the grand scheme of things, that is tiny. So when people are buying and selling this ETF, right, that's not going to have a huge impact on the price of the shares. It's not going to cause Umicore or Tesla to go up if somebody buys more or less shares of this ETF. It'll impact it a little bit, but it's not going to like really, really, you know, shift, uh, move the needle on it. That if this ETF had, let's say, 10 billion under management, that then whether a company is inside an ETF or not, then it starts to really matter. The way ETF performance is calculated is that at the end of every day, they calculate something called the NAV, the NAV, which is the net asset value. The net asset value is gonna be the value of all the underlying holdings, right? All these different shares, the share price of Umicore and Tesla and Johnson Matthey times the weighting it's going to add up the value of all those shares to give us this net asset value. Now, that's only going to happen once a day. That within the day, during the day, the, the shares, the price of the ETF will be moving based on not only the net asset value and the shares, the, the value of the shares that are inside the ETF, but it can be impacted by the volume. That if a lot of people are buying it, that could push the price up. And if a lot of people are selling, that could push the price down. This is why oftentimes we talk about ETFs trading at a premium or discount. So you can see here, there's this little category, premium slash discount, right? And we can see here through different ranges that on March 13th, this is when things were really, really bad. This was trading at a premium that the fund traded above the reported net asset value, okay? Um, by, I think this is a percentile. I think it's by about 3%. It might be $3. I might need to double check that. But my understanding is that this is a percentage. And that this means that because nobody was selling this during the crash, that the price of this ETF was actually a little bit higher than the net asset value and that the greatest discount happened a few days later. This is again, like right at the bottom, where actually probably somebody sold a bunch of these shares and pushed the price down below the net asset value by as much as almost 1%. So if we wanted to really understand how well does an ETF track the net asset value, this is what we would look at, this premium and discount. I'm guessing that these are going to be the largest numbers. Yeah, you can see during normal time, you know, bit of a premium only traded at a discount for a small little bit, you know, that really the numbers are usually a lot smaller, the kind of within a percentage or so, but it's really just during sort of super volatile times, 
because this is a newer or like a more sustainable ETF, that this premium or discount could get wider than it would normally be. So to answer your question, it's actually impacted by both that on a day-to-day -day basis, at the end of the day, the share price is determined by the net va asset value of all these different shares inside the ETF. But during the day, throughout the trading day, the share price is not gonna be the NAV, it's gonna be whatever the market, whatever people are willing to buy it at and sell it at, right? So that's why there will be some variation in there. But that's only during the day, during the trading hours. As soon as the markets close, they calculate the net asset value. That's what your ETF is effectively worth. And that if it was trading at, at a serious premium or at a serious discount, then we would assume that like the market is perfectly efficient and that investors are going to scoop it up if it's trading at a discount or that investors would sell it if it's trading at a premium and then just like buy the underlying shares. I don't know how much that happens with these sustainable ETFs. I think a lot of people just buy and hold them and they're not really looking to kind of game it in that way. But this is why we would say that, that markets are supposed to be efficient because if somebody was really smart and if they saw a premium or a discount, then there would be the opportunity to take advantage of that. So hopefully that, that answers your main question that really the mechanism that it's gonna be both the value of the shares inside and it's gonna be the value, uh, that net asset value. Now, in terms of the real economy, the problem is that there is often a huge disconnect between what's happening in the real economy and what a share price is actually worth. And Tesla is gonna be a great example of this because if we look at Tesla, okay, uh, and we look at the real economy, we look at their actual financials, right? This is gonna be as of year end, all numbers are in thousands. So their total revenue was $24 billion. Hey, that's pretty good, 24 billion, not bad. But their expenses were also gonna be quite high such that their net income is, you can see the cost of their revenue, Right? So they made 24 billion, but it cost them 20 billion, right? That means gross profit, but then they had R&D and they had to pay their salespeople and they have to do all this stuff that their operating income was only 80 million, which is almost nothing. The cost of their debt, because they do have a lot of debt, is $685 million. And you can see that their uh, 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 actual net income was negative 862 a million dollars. So Tesla didn't make any money last year. When we look at their financials, you can see that Tesla, the revenue has been growing. They've been earning more, 7 billion, then 11, almost 12 billion, then 21 and a half billion, then 24 and a half billion dollars, but they haven't actually made any money. So where the, when we talk about the disconnect, right? It's that we're saying that Tesla isn't actually profitable and yet, when we look at their share price, let me look at the chart. This is something that has just absolutely gone to the moon. Let me get rid of these guys and let me just scroll down a little bit that this is the last six months. Let's look at it over the last five years. You can see Tesla, you know, 200 bucks a share all the way up to 350 bucks a share. Whoa, it was trading up there for a while and then all the way back down to 185 bucks a share. And then remember we had almost what I considered a bit of a bubble where it went all the way up to 900. And again, this was people trading. This was like a lot of activity in February, right? Where a lot of people were, you know, riding this Tesla wave. And then, oh my goodness, it came all the way back down to $427. But now just in the rebound, and then just even in the last couple weeks, Tesla has just shot right back up that it was momentarily, I believe, over $1,000 per share. Yeah, $1,025, which like this is the disconnect. That Tesla isn't making any money right now, and yet the stock market values them as if they are wildly, wildly profitable. So, you know, it's a really tricky thing. Part of it is the, psycho the psychology. You know, a lot of people believe in Tesla. They think it's gonna grow right? But this is where we would say that there's this disconnect between the real economy and the stock market. Because we have the real economy, we have the numbers, we have things as they exist today. But the stock market is really this like 
projection over the next 20 years, how much do we think is going to be generated over the last 20 years or over the next 20 years? And then pricing that today. So that's where it is a little bit. This is where there's sort of the crystal ball and, you know, and why are people buying it? And this would be a case where a lot of people were buying shares of Tesla, pushing it higher, 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 right? Is it overvalued? Probably based on today's earnings and today's prices, right? Like it's kind of like when you watch Dragon's Den and the company is like, you know, we're worth. So Tesla like walks into the Dragon's Den and says, hello, Dragons. You know, my company is right now worth you know, $180 billion. And the dragons are like, well, okay, how much money did you make last year? Well, we had, you know, what was it? 84 or $24.5 billion in sales. Okay, what was your profit? Uh, we lost $862 million. Okay, so how are you worth $180 billion if you only made 25 billion and it wasn't even profitable. So the only thing is to say that people believe in Tesla, that they think it's gonna keep growing and they think it's gonna grow into this valuation. And that, you know, this is obviously an extreme example where it's just such a high valuation. There are other examples like this of companies that we think are very, very, very overvalued. But, you know, if investors are willing to pay at the end of the day, you know, a commodity or a good or a service or a stock is really only worth as much as people are willing to pay for it. And right now, people are willing to pay $972 per share, even though the company isn't making any money. And it's really based on faith and trust that, the, that Tesla is going to keep growing and that, you know, it will grow into this $180 billion valuation. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, 